in Oklahoma State country, and really even to some degree Big 12 country, we all know that the recruiting number does in fact matter. But what happens when the recruiting number isn't directly correlated with the amount of results on the field? Why does this happen? And is this going to continue to be the trend forever? You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things Cowboy and Cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by. We're available on all of your podcasting platforms, visually as well on YouTube. Find me personally on Twitter, or as we like to call it, the Daz X app, at All Day O State. Today, we get to have a conversation about recruiting. Why? Because it's the off season, and everybody loves to talk about recruiting. We've got some dudes coming down the pipeline to Oklahoma State University that I think are going to turn some heads. But when you look at overall number 60, 64, 67, that doesn't exactly give you the warm and fuzzies for where Oklahoma State is going in the future. So we got questions, and thankfully we got an expert today to help us with these questions, ladies and gentlemen. Help me welcome on to the show, Brian Smith. Hello, sir. How are we feeling? How are we doing? Doing well, sir. How about yourself? You know, I try I try not to complain because I learned a while back not everybody listens anyhow, so uh, darn it <laughs> if you do, darn it if you don't, right? That is absolutely correct. Well, Brian, uh, I greatly appreciate you coming on, giving us some of your time today. So whenever you look at the, the lay of the land, as it were, in today's recruiting age, whenever you see Oklahoma State recruiting in the 60s, 50s, right? How how does it make sense for them to still be able to make the Big 12 title game two of the last three years? Now, obviously, you could argue the number might be why we're not winning them and we're just getting there. But help me out. Help me out, man. What are you thinking? There's three points here. Number one, Gundy is a tremendous quarterback coach. And let me give you an example. If you've got a five-star quarterback and you've got a five-star offensive guard, they have the exact same ranking. Which one has more of an impact on the football game? It's pretty obvious. Yes, sir. Okay. I think it's pretty obvious as well that Gundy, he obviously played with Barry and everybody at Oklahoma mm-hmm. State. He understands that position and how to maximize it. Yes, sir. Not many guys can do it like that. And he's not necessarily getting five-star kids, but he's getting some pretty good quarterbacks. They maximize at that position. So the ranking at that spot in particular is cataclysmically different than what they put on that sheet of paper or that screen you're looking at, whatever. Right. That's gotcha. one. Two is the portal. It is the weirdest thing because like some rosters, you bring in these guys and the numbers look right. The players look good. These are guys who are highly recruited. Maybe they played at Georgia or Texas or whatever. But what about the fit? Cody, I mean, you've played, you've been around football. I bet locker rooms are weird, man. And this is not necessarily a shot at state or an uptick for state. Sometimes yeah. you got everything you think is right. The recruiting numbers match, and then it doesn't, it doesn't mesh. So this past year, they're 10 and four, right? That's a team that many people probably didn't project to win as many games as they did. But Oklahoma State, uh, probably just about nobody outside of that locker room, really. But they had the right chemistry. And then third, while they had it, some other teams with higher ranking, I'm looking directly at you, Texas A&M, as an example, a school that you all recruit against, and <laughs> an old school rival. I saw them play live, their game at Miami. That was about as discombobulated a talented roster over the last five years as I've ever seen. Yeah. It was kind of comes to fruition. They gave up like 47 points to Miami. Miami had talent, but – I'm like, what are y'all doing? There's guys running Scott free in the secondary. There was a bust a few times up front on the offensive line that was just like, and (laughs) it wasn't a talent problem. So you have to have both things. The talent has to match with the coaching, the scheme, everybody. And to be honest, Cody, it's why college football is so fascinating because rosters have always churned anyway. But now with the portal, can we even put a number on it? It's infinite. 
like how many times you're going to have guys coming and going on your roster. So it's a year round endeavor for me, somebody who works in recruiting. Yeah. I have gotten to the point, not that I like it, that I cover the portal about as much as I do recruiting. It's just the way it is. Brian, you know what? I love you. It's almost like you've done this a time or 73,000, but that is a very, <laughs> very, very good point, man. I, and I've you know, talked to people and some people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've said a thousand times, your recruiting services that used to travel all over high school to high school to high school, those right. guys now have to dedicate a significant amount of time to not only who's in the portal, but throughout the end of the season, you have to be able to identify, uh, for example, Ollie Gordon. Everybody in no, their yeah. mom thought Ollie Gordon was gone because they knew everybody was going to dump bags of cash or at least the potential um, idea of the bags of cash at Ollie Gordon. And everyone's like, well, Oklahoma State can't compete. They'll never be able to keep it. Right. And, and whenever you have to dedicate so much time to the portal, there's a lot of high school kids that are going to be kind of swept under the rug, which is kind of to me why I, I wanted to ask this. Right. Beautiful segue is because the numerical value associated with the talent on the field, to me, this number is going to become more skewed over the years. I don't think it's going to tighten up and get better. I think it's going to get more loosey-goosey, realistically. I think it will, too, and for certain schools more so than others. Okay. You're in a state in Oklahoma that has some high school talent, yeah. but at the same time, traditionally, there are five to ten kids within your state they can play at Ohio state. They can play at Florida or USC or whatever. Yeah. Then there's a pretty big drop. So you're looking at a lot of loose ends, kids that have some potential. Then you go down to Dallas and Houston, East Texas. That's where Oklahoma state and Oklahoma have always recruited. That's not going to change. Right, right. Right. But at the same time, because of the portal kids coming and going, there's no way to calculate chemistry. Well, and you, no know, you, you brought up chemistry, right? Last year, Oklahoma State, it was not, it was, it was our worst year in over 20 years. It just, it was what it was. Um, right. Whenever you look at that, and then we started this season two and two, dude, we lost to South Alabama. We didn't just lose, we got beat up by South Alabama. Then we turn around and lose to Iowa State. After that, right, you could, you could feel that the locker room either had to galvanize real quick, fast, and in a hurry, or it was going to be another wild ride of a season. And that's right. what happened. The locker room did, in fact, say, you know what, guys? We're better than two and two. We're better than South Alabama. Everybody put in more work. Everybody put in more effort. And, and you're exactly right. The hustle, the, the brotherly love, right? The, the admiration of playing for the dude next to you, it shined. It shined out. But as you mentioned earlier, that doesn't always happen. I mean, looking at you, Texas, for a decade, they were top five, top ten classes, and they would barely win seven, eight games. Now, they obviously figured it out this year, but you know they were always a top five recruiting school, and it never correlated on the field. So, yeah, you do have to have some of that locker room. It's amazing how certain schools forever were in that boat. Like right now, I, I don't like making a lot of projections because of the portal. Right. But if you put a gun to my head right now, I would say Georgia or Texas would be my pick to win it next year because they finally started to have some chemistry. And it's, again, Texas, I, they're not hurting for, for players. But it took good coaching to get it there. And a lot of the kids that were always mad and weaving or just didn't mm -hmm. galvanize themselves in the, in, the, in the locker room with other guys, they've started to do that. It's amazing what happens when you get the right guy in place at a yeah. school like UT. But at the same time, now you're also in a situation, whether you're Texas or Oklahoma State or anybody else, you're one player away from being really good or really bad almost instantly because the kid wants to leave. Yeah. Every day is a new challenge because, and I'm sure many people have seen this, the legislation, and I don't like it when politics enter college football, but there's a lot of stuff going on with that right now that's mm -hmm. not good. I can tell you whether people want to hear it or not, it is not good to have unlimited transfers. It is not good to not have any kind of penalty for a kid sitting out because there won't be any chemistry and the sport's not going to work well. And I know flat out that college coaches, some people I know are looking to go up a level because they don't want to deal with this. We're in a right. bit of a day. That's another story for another day, but that impacts this stuff too, because I'm really concerned about the coaching taking a dive because we can't lose a bunch of guys that don't want to deal with this stuff. And that's another layer of why certain schools may have the right player, but they don't have the right person 
trying to mend that fence on the practice field each and every day before a game. Right. Well, before we uh, tell everybody how they can capitalize or maximize on their potential dollar dollar bills, you mentioned a couple teams that could likely win the title this year. The first team, it's physically impossible for me to agree with you, so I won't. Um, but the second team, Georgia, I can get with that, right? I can absolutely see precisely what you're saying. And then on to your last point before we uh, we we jump ahead is if you look at Oklahoma State, last year we lost like 26 dudes. This year we've only lost like seven. Big difference. Big, Big difference. difference. But we have 20, technically, technically 21 returning starters, bro. Like I've never seen anything like this, ever. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen even 20. Uh, see, Alan Bowman makes number 20, but people tend to forget our starting safety who started the first half of the season's Lyric Rawls, right? So he's back. So technically, we have 21 of 22 back, buddy. That's a wild number. <laughs> I don't know what their schedule is. I haven't looked at it, but they've got a chance to make the playoff next year. Yes, we do. And it, it it would be really look I, I I'm not picking on any school but it's nice to see somebody different at least make it in maybe they get maybe they get bludgeoned I don't know right but you know if they play Georgia I'm betting on the dogs okay you know what I mean yeah. like I'm not stupid but at the same time it's nice to see something different and it's also I like Gundy I like his bluntness I, that's just kind of my personality anyway. And I know he can coach, so it'd be kind of curious to see what he could do in that scenario. Man, I'll tell you this. Um, he did what, what I have found to be the greatest turnaround I've ever seen. And you know what, dude? I've talked to people I played the game with. I've talked to players that have been to Oklahoma State and other schools. The, the chances of you turning a locker room around when you're 2-2 two and two and things are going super south is like maybe whoa. 5%, right? Yeah, whoa. So to turn it around and then end up reeling off six in a row and then end up, you know, winning nine of your last 11, essentially, that's crazy. And we get a lot of that back. We got, but we also have a lot of people coming in that I think are going to be pivotal to our future success. But before we do that, I do have to remind everybody, you can make money, honey. You can put it in your wallet because FanDuel is, Right now, our new customers get 150 bones back in bonus bets guaranteed. All you got to do is place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks back in bonus bets, win or lose. You already know the app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. There's a wide variety of things to bet on, whether it be parlays, over, unders, Heismans, division titles, Super Bowls, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on right now and make your next bet your best bet with FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on because FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. Okay, buddy. Now we get to talk uh, some fun stuff, right? We get to talk about the future. Everybody loves the future. The most popular person on every campus is the brand new quarterback. So that might be a decent place to start. From what you've seen out of Mayo Locke Smith coming from Juniper Sierra, California. Is this a guy or is he just a guy? I think he's got the tools to be an NFL quarterback from a physical standpoint. He's got the long frame. He's got the, the ability to hit guys on the deep ball. He's got arm strength. He'll throw the trajectory pass. He'll throw the line, line drive. Yeah. When I watched his film, I remembered that like, oh yeah, I watched this kid last summer, but I didn't had the opportunity at that point, obviously, to see his senior film. He took another jump from junior to senior year. Gotcha. And let's be honest, when was the last time Okie State got somebody from Northern California to jump on board? at court? I mean, it's it's a random thing. Recruiting is a lot different than it used to be. And those are, you know what? It's interesting. We were talking about this off air. That kid might have went to Oregon State or to Washington or something like that. It's different now. Like, I don't know how to project Northern California used to send a bunch of kids north to Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, yeah. Washington State. Oh, yeah. But now I, I don't know how that's going to work out. And this kid can play. Like as a redshirt freshman, I don't expect him to come in and start or something. But as a redshirt freshman, he's the kind of physically talented kid that can play at now what the, is the power four, not the power five 
as goofy as that sounds. I, I'm having a hard time adjusting <laughs> that, Cody. It's, but it's true. It's what it is now. So, yeah, 100%. I mean, he's the kind of kid that can play at Ohio State. Okay, Ohio State quarterback, let's be honest, that's about as good as it gets over the last decade. So I think this is a really big steal, and I'm surprised they were to get him. I understand it because I'm a Gundy fan. A lot of people, if you don't like State, you probably don't like Gundy. Now, I, I'm one of those guys that looks at it from an unbiased view. He can coach quarterbacks. This was a good decision. He fits what they do. He'll do some mobile stuff, but primarily, you got to make read. If you want to get paid, you right. got to make reads after the snap. There is no shortcut there. You're going to learn some of that stuff if you go work with Gundy. So I think this is a really good pick for Smith. Well, being in the recruiting realm that you are, I'm going to give you a name to follow along okay. to, and it's Benny Tonga. Benny Tonga is responsible for us getting Jalen Warren. He was responsible for us getting Mason Cobb. He was pretty daggone responsible for us landing Mayolake Smith. He's responsible for us even being in the running for Micah Capana ended up at Michigan. That dude. Because of his his you know Tongan Samoan uh, abilities, he's opened up the Utah region for us so well recently. And I'm telling you, without Benny Tonga, we don't have the West Coast recruiting flavor that we have. That is something that I've talked about on a gazillion shows on Locked On. If if you're watching this podcast or listening, if you take nothing else from this podcast, hear the following: whether you like it or not, kids pick the person in the polo. Not the logo on the polo 99.9% of the time. Here's a great example. I got up this morning and on Twitter, there's a thing that says Julian Sayan is going to enter the transfer portal. He's a California kid, ironically. Right. He was the kid that signed with Nick Saban at Alabama. Nick is obviously retiring. Yeah. Not, not a newsflash there. He was the number one quarterback in the country by many people. He picked Bama, which Okay, that's you know kind of a brand there. How dare he? <laughs> but at the same time, he picked Saban. They've lost Caleb Downs, number one safety last year. Started for them as a freshman. They've lost the Caden Proctor, arguably the top tackle last year. Started at left tackle for Alabama. All these yeah. kids picked a coach, not the University of Alabama. Now, Alabama fans don't want to hear that either. And if Oklahoma State was in that same boat, their fans probably wouldn't want to hear it. They yeah. pick the coach. It is what it is. So right now, Alabama, a buddy of mine sent me a text with their two deep. And this mm -hmm. is right before Caden Proctor had left, et cetera. And he put a red line under each kid that had left. It looked like somebody took a machine gun to that thing because it was bleeding out. They've lost about half the guys that were on their starting two, two deep and several reserves. Alabama, even in this transfer portal era, is going to struggle. Like they're, they're going to lose three, four games next year. Right, no doubt is, about which it. Which is crazy for them. Well, yeah, I know because they've they've won at least ten games since Nick's it's since two oh eight. Every year, like ten wins is crappy, which and is then, insane, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> well, you're right, but man. Now it, it just shows you what the transfer portal can do, and why your opening point when you introduce this show, recruiting rankings with the portal makes it difficult. You can't replace Caleb Down. He was a freshman All-American safety running the – I was on the field at the Iron Bowl watching him. That's not a normal guy. You can't replace that. And you know what? He'll probably play for Georgia is my guess. He'll go right back to his home state. But it is what it is. You have to be careful for what you wish, though, because right now Oklahoma State's got a coach that's pretty good. I think the fans need to get behind him. they got a chance to be really good next year. You ain't wrong, and you're right. Nowadays, it's the guy that's – more important most of the time, right? You're you're 100 accurate, yeah. um, and whenever you have the right guys, well, I and mean, when you think of Oklahoma State, and you think of Mike Gundy, we've got Coach Hammer in the safeties, we've got Coach Duffy in the back end, Coach Joe Bob Clements, we have so many coaches, Coach Wozniak, Wozniak, who just won the running back coach of the year, that have all been here for nine years, twelve years, fourteen years, sixteen years, and that's got to be beneficial. In this whole, you know, core categorically numbered system that we're looking at, right? Well, I mean, experience matters. Continuity matters. They're on the same page. And I think that they're, uh, let's just give Oklahoma State staff some credit. While the recruiting ranking, I'm sure they would like higher and they want some more four and five star D tackles. Don't get me wrong. Right. Yeah, right. 
the kids that they're getting, like especially like you mentioned, some of the Tongan kids, et cetera, out west, Utah's made a living off those kids for years, and most of them are two and three star kids. Yep. They're not ranked the way they should because they're from a lot of small towns, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oak State's evaluation is probably about as good as it gets in the power four. Yeah. And that's why they're competing at a high level. If they can start out good this next year, and sometimes, you know, that doesn't happen, but right. with as much experience as they have coming back, why wouldn't they be a top 10 team next year? Oh, well, well most polls I'm seeing us are between like 12 and 16 to start the season. I think that's pretty fair. I, that might be low though, because of the portal stuff we're talking about. Here's the one last point I'll make on this. And I know this is not what anybody wants to hear, but it's true. I'm not going to name schools, but I know there are a few schools that they brought in kids that were basically mercenaries. It wasn't a talent problem, but it, once anything went wrong and they couldn't make the playoff or whatever, I'll let your mind wander on that, but Oklahoma State is not in that boat. Gundy wants kids that want to be there, that want to be at Oklahoma State. I mean, he's a grad. It means mm -hmm. a little more to him, obviously. And I'm not saying like Saban loves Alabama, et cetera. There, there are other guys like that. But it's different when it's your school. He's not just going to bring in some idiot because he can catch a pass or sack the quarterback. Right. There's going to be more chemistry there. And I guarantee you, that when you brought up that point to me earlier about though like, they've got 20, 21 starters back, you're one of about five people in America that outside of that locker room that knows that. Their average guy in the AP voting poll doesn't know a single player at Oklahoma State. Other they don't than care. All, yeah. But yep. if Oklahoma State starts the season next year, let's say three and oh, and they're ranked number eight, they'll pay attention then. And that's the only time it really matters. Well, that's the plan. That's the objective. We talked about having talent, right? You were you were there for the Iron Bowl. Oklahoma State's got a couple dudes that are on a little bit of a different level when you think about a Nick Martin and a Colin Oliver. And when you talk about the dude that they're following, that's Brian Nardo. Buddy, this defensive coordinator is, he's a recruiting whisperer, right? He's young, he's energetic, he gets it. He's been in so many living rooms and, and, and been told no at the lower college levels that he's perfected the craft of getting in liver, living rooms and being realistic, which is why we were able to still land in Cleveland from Texas. I'll say it again because we don't get that often. We got a player that Texas went after hard and heavy. When you look at uh, Mr. Landon Cleveland, six foot, 190 pounds safety, what is the thing that stands out most, right, when you pop on film to you? Versatility. I okay. think in today's age, if you don't have a nickel that can play against, okay, first and 10, they come out in 22 personnel. Oh, it's power. Or is it? Then they go and they put the tight end in the slot and they run a screen to the 59160 kid. If your nickel gets run over, the 59160 kid's doing an end zone dance. So you got to have guys like that. He can come down and play that spot. Or if you want to play him in the middle of the field in a more traditional role, he can do that as well. I'm not saying he's going to come into Oak State and run the defense from the back end because eventually that's what you want your safety to do. Yeah, Freshman, that's probably not a good idea. Right. But he can be in the box and do different things that are more simplistic to start. Your point about Texas offering him is not surprising. If you watch any of his film, it's not a real difficult task. Right. He's very athletic. He's naturally a football player and he has physicality. I like him as a guy that could at least part-time play down on that nickel because it's the hardest spot in, on the field now, physically, yep. regardless, yep. because you got to play against the big tight end sometimes, and then sometimes the 59160 guys in front of you. It's right. really weird. But packages that you bring out onto the field, they don't mean how they're going to line up anymore. Defenses are always in a disadvantage. Getting versatility like that is very big for the Cowboys. You know, I think I think the idea, and I also think that one of the biggest things that was you know, alluring for him was whenever you watch what Kendall Daniels does at Oklahoma State, right? Big time, sure. high, high four-star that went to A&M, decided that it wasn't right, came home, blah, 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 blah. That dude, Kendall Daniels, he's an NFL prototypical guy. He's a six-foot-four, 230-pound yeah. safety that runs a four five forty. right? He's everything you want to be. And I think Landon Cleveland definitely fits in that mold. Um, and you know what, man? 
whenever you look at uh, somebody, let's say uh, we're, we're, we've talked about the safety position, we've talked about Nick Martin at linebacker. We do lose Xavier Benson, right? He's uh, put his name in, in for the NFL draft, but we've got some young linebackers that I think will have the ability to at least push for a two deep opportunity. Do you kind of see that as a, as a feasible opportunity as well? You have to do it that way. You have to rotate now. Like I just said a minute ago, defense is always on the disadvantage. Hurry up offenses, especially in the Big 12, for the love of mankind. Texas Tech, Texas A&M, could be anybody can run that. you got to rotate guys. And now you need guys that are at linebacker and at safety as well. that are right. versatile. If you're not rotating, you're not winning. Oklahoma State and everybody else is going to have guys get beat up. You just hope you don't have one spot on the field that gets all the attrition, then you got a problem. But, yeah, right. you got to do it that way, man. Uh, your point about the safety coming home, that's another point about the portal too, by the way. It only takes one or two like that to kind of get you over the top. You need an NFL special player to yes. get to the playoff and do something. Yep. So good for Oklahoma State. I, I mean, if we're watching his film out of high school, I'm like, yeah, he's he's a little different. Yeah, I remember I was so mad. I mean, obviously, I never want anybody to go to OU like ever, but whenever he decided to go to a and I was like, how do we let the top player in the state get out of the state. Like, how does this happen? Thankfully, things weren't exactly all they were cracked up to be at A&M, so he decided to uh, to come on home. But when you look at the linebackers that Oklahoma State was able to bring in, we were talking uh, off air, and one of the names that obviously gets mentioned quite a bit is Gunnar Wilson as one of the most underrated in this class. Yep. And the beauty of Gunnar Wilson, and, and I've been able to, to talk about him on this show, Anytime you have any player at any position that the opposing offense has to directly go around, that's when you know you probably got to do. Like if you look at the linebacker on the other side of the field in Melissa, Texas, that dude has like a hundred and something tackles because every team went away from Gunnar Wilson. And just like if you see Malcolm Rodriguez in the NFL with the Lions, he's too good not to play. Linebackers, so they put him at tight end. They put him at fullback. They found different ways to utilize him, and Melissa did that with Gunnar Wilson, and it put him in a pretty deep playoff run. What is the most impressive about Mr. Mr. Wilson on film, brother man? Right place, right time, instinctual. Um, I don't. I hate using the term throwback linebacker, but he has some of that in him. But with some of the new school caveats, if you will. Because linebacker today is a nightmare with the RPO game. You need to be on the outside right, but you also need to be on the outside left because, oh, wait a minute, quarterback still has the ball. Oh, wait a minute. The right. It's very hard. And he has the athleticism to get around, but he also knows the best path to get there. One of my favorite comments was a Lou Holtz quote saying, it doesn't matter how fast you run if you don't know where you're going. Well, linebacker today, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of guys that suck, even though they're great athletes, because they can't read what's going on. And it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. This kid has more of a natural grasp of what's going on. And he's probably been coached very well there. That's a good program. But if he comes in and plays, would it surprise you, Cody? It won't surprise me. I do. I really think that he has the ability to push the two deep. And he's going to walk into the building at like 6'3", 230. Yeah, he's As big enough to that help. <laughs> that, ma that matters. You need size in the interior. I think they'll move him around eventually. This is yep, kind of like the same deal with Landon. But as a freshman, I'm hoping he has a role. I don't care what it is. Whatever point A is, stick with it. Then maybe game seven through 12, you broaden it a little bit. Sometimes they get thrown the book and, you know, the playbook eats them alive. Yeah. But he can play downhill if you want, or maybe you put him on the edge a little bit. Well, Figure Brian Nardo's three three five is primarily predicated upon simplicity, right? The KISS method. See ball, get ball, hit dude with ball, make ball go to other team, right? That's <laughs> that's him. That's Gunnar Wilson. Well, that's why you win football games. Sometimes the scheme thing, it's paralysis by analysis. And that's something that not everybody really understands what I'm saying. But if you ever looked at some of these playbooks, like literally how thick they are, that's not the important part. The important part is how much of it are you really using? How much are you thrusting on the freshman and sophomore? It's one thing for your fifth year senior middle linebacker to yeah. kind of get through that bad boy. It's another 
for the freshman or the sophomore. So as long as guys like Landon in the back end and this kid aren't being pushed too much and they just go after the guy and they're playing forward more than they're playing backward, they can help Oak State in 2024. Well, That's all you could ask. And I, this is case, staff, so they should. Worst case, he's probably – going to be a good special teams guy, right? I just mentioned Malcolm Rodriguez. It's the same thing. When he got called from the Lions when he got drafted, they said, hey, we want you to come here, be a special teams dog. And he was like, deal, got it, done. And then he ended up starting as a rookie because the you, you remember the old wedge guys? You mentioned old oh, school? Oh, God, those guys are nuts. Gunnar Wilson, um, I'll tell his dad, Kirby, right here, right now, your son would have been the wedge guy. Right. So if he comes to OSU with that mentality of I'm going to be the wedge dude, I fully anticipate him to at least shine quite a bit on special teams. Well, that's the first step for a lot of linebackers and safeties. You got to cut your teeth. It's always been that way. Mm -hmm. Now, with these two, they have the ability to use their brain a little more. So you're hoping they could hit the field on first and 10 as well. Yeah. (laughs) So get it, I, I think that, get it, buddy. No, you could. I think that uh, Oklahoma State also has the advantage with all their starters back. They don't have to thrust them in. There you They're go. going to be around with experienced guys. That's all that matters. If they can be accepted in the locker room, and I think they will be, they're really good players, they'll find their niche. It will handle itself in time. I don't know what Oklahoma State's best player will be on the edge or whatever. Right. That guy can help out somebody. Maybe somebody in the deep secondary can help out. The, you know, land it, It'll take care of itself. But if they can just get a little bit of help, why wouldn't they be the favorite to at least win the Big 12? I, I completely agree, man. And when you think about this class, um, especially from a defensive perspective, because Brian Nardo's definitely that guy. Is there somebody other than the guys that we've mentioned that you think might have an, an opportunity to push for immediate playing time as well, at least in the two, three deep category? Well, there's always the chance for a receiver with Gundy. That's true. That's, that's the way I would look at it. I'm not saying Des Bryant's walking into the building, right? but somebody that can help in some capacity in today's world, why there should be pretty much every year. And then at the same time, you're always going to be looking for another running back. They, they just had a pretty good one, uh, whether or not he's helped them recruit more that are going to be successful. Like, oh, I don't know about that. But they got to be able to take some pressure off the passing game. They've always been balanced. I would say those two spots are usually the, the players that have the best chance. So I'll go with that. Well, I'll tell you, a name that has been floating around as you know, somebody who very, very, very well could push would be Tamaric Johnson. Whenever you look at him, you know, we did talk about just the Middle Othean area, right? And how whenever you come from a talent rich area of operation, probably going to be pretty successful. But why do you think Tamaric Johnson seems to be mentioned in the same breath as Elaine in Cleveland and Amaya Locke Smith on a pretty consistent basis? Uh, around high school circles. He's a natural pass rusher. He can run. He can bend. He's in that same frame that a lot of guys from 20, 30 years ago that when I first started following college football really closely, my favorite pass rusher was Florida State's Peter Bull Ware. He had like 20 sacks his junior year and turned pro. Hit the gas, dip the shoulder, power through with a rip, and good luck to the quarterback. This, I'm not saying this kid's Peter Boulware. Uh, that's about as rare as it gets. But at the same time, he has that same kind of frame. Peter was 215 coming out of high school. He left Florida State at 255, 260. This kid is thin at 205, 210, but he can run like a deer. So, okay. yeah, 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 the Oklahoma State weight program will certainly do this young man good. But those are the kinds of players you have to have long term to get there. And by the end of the season, barring injury, this is the kind of kid that, you know, game one, he may not be ready. That's right. Plausible. Yeah. But going through the season and seeing how it's done day to day, he will make strides. They found another kid. That's another Dallas kid. Shocker. That's a good football player. I know that you being a, you know, <laughs> an Oak State fan, when Oklahoma State doesn't find kids that are gyms in the greater East Texas and Dallas area, that will not be a successful recruiting class. 
That's just the way that is. It's always been that way. And I followed recruiting since like 1990. So it's important for them to do it. It's not changing anytime. He's another one. And that's a good program he's coming out of. He'll make an impact in some way, shape or form for the Pokes. My God. All right. So before I let you skip that on out of here, you've mentioned, right? Somebody like a Mayalak A. Smith traditionally back in the day would have went to an Oregon or a Washington state or an Oregon state or a Washington. So I got a question for you, but real quick, before we get around this turn here, I got to remind everybody, you don't have to stress any more about planning months in advance for hotels and rental cars and all that fun jazz. You don't need to worry about all that because game time tickets takes all of the guesswork out of you buying your tickets. So whether it be right at the event or an hour after the event, you can get killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and the best price guaranteed. They've got the lowest price and they've got event cancellation, job loss protection. Who does that? And again, you see the view from the, from the seat before you purchase. So you don't have to worry about the hanky panky of buying a section and getting stuffed in another one. Take the guesswork out of buying your tickets right now, today with Game Time. Download the app, create the account, use a code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. But again, create that account, redeem the code locked on, L O C K E D O N, for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, boss man, before I let you skedaddle, there is inevitably going to be some level of shift, right? And you're already seeing it with all of the Oregon State transfers, Washington State transfers, after both of which having very, very successful seasons. And then you also got to sprinkle in, if you've got teams like San Diego State, like Boise State, that now know their opportunities of getting in the Power Five just went down significantly. Likely it will never happen now for them. So some of those fringe three-star guys, right, that kind of get uh, overlooked from Utah and Idaho and Wyoming, those guys likely aren't going to be going to Washington State in Oregon State, right? Or am I just trying to be selfish from, from a Big 12 perspective? I think people want to play in the Power Five, and now it's the Power Four. Right. It's nothing different. It's just the name changed. I know from talking to kids all across the country, because I go to Under Armour events, Elite 11 events, and I go to all these seven on sevens and the high schools and stuff. Nobody has told me I can't wait to play in the group of five. Not one time. (laughs) So yeah, not one time. It's true. Look, man, man, I I put over 20,000 miles on my car this past year, just going to recruiting stuff and doing stuff. That doesn't count the plane trips. Never had a kid tell me I just want to play a group of five. What does that tell you? So Oklahoma State is in the group of four. That's going to benefit them in some capacity. The state that is most interesting to me now moving forward is California. Still have SC and UCLA. That's, I mean, that's not hard to sell. If you've ever been to La La Land, look, I've been to Mm -hmm. around both schools. It's not hard to sell. But they got to travel to the Midwest. Some of the kids may not like it. I don't know. I'm curious to see how it works because there is no fit for just West Coast football that's power four. There isn't. I don't know how that's going to work, but Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Texas, every school in the state of Texas is probably at least going to graze through L.A. and San Diego. And, I mean, Sark knows that state anyway because he was at SC at one point. They're all going to look there. If you're not getting one or two kids because of this and then maybe even going up to Seattle or Oregon like Portland or something, it's not going to be hard to beat them for the. Cause why would you stay? Yeah. Why would you stay? Well, so, and you know, I, I didn't, I didn't put it in uh, the sidebar there, the bullet points I should have. But this is, dude, we might be talking power three pretty soon with what the ACC has going on. So the conversation about you know California, Arizona, that area, that could be the same conversation we're having for your Boston colleges and your Georgia techs. Right. And, and I'm not throwing, you know, shade at, at Boston college. I am throwing shade at Georgia tech since their coach doesn't know football, but um, those guys, if you're looking at potentially going to one of those schools and you know that the ACC is currently pretty unstable, that's got to change the landscape a little bit too. 
Well, I think that the lawsuits that are being thrown about from states, the District of Columbia and everything else, it's so confusing. I don't even like to read about it. Yeah. So that's probably not going to, if it doesn't make somebody that's 50 years old feel comfortable, I'm sure the teenagers don't like it either. Right. So I don't know how that's going to end. And like Florida State's the one that's at the forefront of trying to get out. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Uh, that's a lot of money because they signed the document, man. There is no yeah, way around right. that. So, and it doesn't end till 2036. Whoever idea that was to sign that paper, that's on them. I'm curious about it because that also impacts recruiting from many different perspectives. But number one, those top end guys, I can go wherever I want. Why would I truly want to go where there's more turmoil? Right. Yeah. That's, that's going to start to play out. Now that may not be a public conversation. I may not get that information in an interview. I almost guarantee I won't because they're going to be taught. Don't, don't burn any bridges. And I get it. Yep. But that's not going to help you. The SEC and the Big Ten have got it made right now. The Big 12 is the unknown. And except for a couple of schools in the ACC, like Clemson, Florida State, Miami, right? everybody else is a little bit in limbo. Yep. No, I, I couldn't agree more, man. And I do think, circling back around, why this will have a, a direct impact on Oklahoma State specifically is because of the instability and the turmoil reverting back to everything we just talked about. Dudes want to go play with Benny Tonga there. Dudes want to come play with Brian Nardo here. And I do think that now that Mike Gundy's become more open, right, to the NIL transfer paying players, like nobody's going to be able to have it misconstrued. Oklahoma State came up with big boy money for Ollie Gordon, Nick Martin, Colin Oliver, and Kendall Daniels. And Brendan Presley, we just did. We had to. But a year ago, Mike Gundy would have said, nope, sorry, see you later. Spencer Sanders, everybody else, good riddance. But Mike Gundy's changed his tune in that department. And you saw the locker room buy-in. You see us returning 90% of a roster. I do think that the instability in the ACC and the dumpster fire that is no longer of the Pac-12 will allow us to get more Mayalock A. Smiths just because of the continuity, right? Oklahoma State, we're going to be part of the 12-team playoff equation more often than not. Like, I'll say the uncomfortable thing that all Cowboys don't repeat out loud, but OU's gone. Texas is gone. Texas has never really been an issue for Oklahoma State until this season for the last, you know, 12 years or so, but OU has been, right? They're gone. You know, Arizona, they're they're in a they're keeping a lot of players, but that's still a lot of instability. Utah, they lost 80% of their back end of the defense. So they're going to be good with Cam Rising, but it's not the same. So when you look at Oklahoma State and next season, we should be in Arlington. We should be in the 12th team CFP. I think they're a 10 and 2 team, give or take, depending on injuries. And then if you get to the playoffs, you obviously got to win the title. You got to win the Big 12 twice. If you lose that, that's on you. That's on you. Yeah. And and I think if if we can win it, right, if we can win it, that's when I think we'll take this next step, even numerically, because some of it is, and you know this is true. You've been been covering this since the early 90s, right? When somebody commits or gets a big-time offer from a Bama, they get an extra half star just right then and there, point blank period. When somebody commits to Oklahoma State, they're like, oh, okay, well, they're a three-star that'll get built up. It does happen. And if Oklahoma State kind of puts itself in position that everybody knows, Oklahoma State, Utah, Arizona, K-State, we're going to run the Big 12, I do think that that perception alone with a Big 12 title in hand will improve our number pretty, pretty dramatically. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? Uh, or am I just kind of crap, crap shooting here? No, I think there's going to be some truth to it. I think this next season is a chance for Oklahoma State to broaden the eyes of the media because they should do well. Again, that's on Oklahoma State. You have to prove it. But if you do, that will improve your opportunities with recruits. It will also improve your opportunities to build your brand with different commercial outfits and everybody putting you in the spotlight, which comes back to recruiting, comes back to the portal, comes back to bringing in coaches and allows the boosters to say, you know what, maybe we should go all in 
kind of like T. Boone Pickens did back in the day. You need all of those things working together to be successful in Oklahoma State. This could be their year. I mean, how many teams have 20 plus guys coming back on their roster with a good coaching staff? Well, there's one. It's in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Can I get an amen? Heck yeah, go pokes. I love all of it, Brian. I I greatly, greatly appreciate it, man. I know that you have a hand in recruiting and helping with a multitude of areas. Locked on, obviously, is very appreciative of what you provide. I know that I am personally. We don't get to get, get linked up enough because you're so daggone busy, but I appreciate your time. Let everybody else know out there how they can follow you, how they can get a hold of you and watch your stuff, sir. At FB Scout underscore Florida on X, formerly Twitter. Right now, I'll be really honest. I'm most fascinated, even though I don't cover them directly, what's going on at Alabama. Anything that happens there, the Julian Sayan situation, Nick Saban, because all these players impact the rest of college football, because they got to go somewhere. Don't be surprised if one of these kids ends up in Stillwater. It could happen. So I'm ready to talk about it. I'm here for all of it. Cole Adams, he's talking to you. The 100-meter champion from Owasso, Oklahoma. Why play wide receiver at Bama when you can do it in Stillwater and make the playoff? All right, buddy. You, Hey, Brian said it, guys. Brian, Brian said it. All right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Absolutely, brother man. Thank you very, very, very much. I, I do greatly appreciate your time. You keep killing it. We'll hook up again, buddy. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Well, y'all, I reckon that's probably all we're going to have for this one right here. You know the drill. As always, I love you. God bless. Go Pokes. And thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen here on Lockdown Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere, so happy you choose to be here. Go like it if you like the daggone thing. Share, comment, subscribe. And all my podcasting people out there, you're the foundation, the, ba- the bricks, the glue, the all of it. Go leave a review. And if I'm giving you five stars, hit the daggone five stars. All right, y'all. Later, taters. <laughs>